<laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, we'll start with self introductions. Uh, this is uh, what day are we? January 29th, SCTA CAC meeting. And my name is John Bly. I'm with the Engineering Contractors Association and chair of this committee. And we'll go around this way. Lisa Bessi representing uh, Santa Rosa Chamber. Uh, Eris Weaver, Executive Director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Mark Hale, Building Industry Association. Brian Lang, representing District 4. Tom Banning, representing District 3. Tom Conlon, representing the Sonoma County Conservation Council. Steve Erdoba, representing the Sierra Club. Kathleen Cortez, Area Agency on Aging Human Services. Dennis Harder, representing Sonoma County Alliance. Mark Soylen, representing District 2. All right. Thank you. And uh, hello, staff and, and everybody. Hello uh, on the on the screen to uh, those on the screen. So do we have public comments for items not on the regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll move forward. We've got a pretty full uh, agenda, as is usual for this group. So... We'll start with uh, administrative items and approval of the November 27th meeting minutes. Um, is there a motion? Trust everybody's had a chance to look at them. A motion to approve. So moved. Harris, to, uh, motion to approve. Steve? Uh, on uh, the third page. Can we get a second just so we can get into discussion? I'll say. Brian, second. Yes, Steve. I uh, just wanted to mention the third page. Uh, there's a discussion about the fourth or fifth paragraph down about the Air Resources Board's goal of reducing VMT, but it doesn't put in the amount. And when I made that, the, the reduction by 25% by 2030 is a huge goal. So I think we really ought to have that in our minutes, recognizing what they're asking of us. I see staff nodding their head. They're, they're in agreement with you. So thank you for that modification. Are there any other changes or modifications or errors in the minutes? <clears throat> Anybody seeing? Seeing no hands. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And any abstentions? I uh, wasn't here. <laughs> abstention? Yeah. Okay, one abstention, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I'm going to toss it over to. Ross to talk about the, the chair and uh, vice chair elections for February. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. That'll be very, very brief. This is just an announcement that um, we'd like to provide notice that at the next meeting um, on February 26th, we will be holding elections for the chair and vice chair of this committee. So those elected to fill these seats will have the responsibility of running the meetings and uh, with SCTA staff report as support, as well as uh, representing the CAC um, in front of the board and other venues. So just be aware, we will be doing that um, at the next meeting. Thank you, Ross. Um, can I refresh my memory as to how that all works? So we go to the next meeting and at the meeting, we'll open it for discussion and somebody will throw out nominations. Yeah, so it will <clears throat> be a, Motion um, with a roll call vote, I believe, is is what we're talking about. All right. Yeah, and uh, and you will continue as chair until another one is elected. However, um, you're certainly up for for reelection okay. as well as vice chair. Great. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, guys. All right. Any questions on that? Um, and we are on to transit integration study results. This might be a pretty popular thing to talk about. Who's, who's I'll be presenting that. Thank you. Um, I'll just be sharing my screen here. Um, uh, yeah, I think we're good. Can you make sure the data has a, a microphone? Thank you. Can you hear me? Much better. Thanks. Sorry, right. I'm not seeing my correct window. So just a minute. There we go. Oh, 
All right. So, um, you know, this the title, I'll just start, the, the title of the item um, was actually uh, from thinking before that we would have some results from our study right now, but um, I'll explain a little bit more about that in my presentation. Um, I'm really going to give you a kind of an overall um, overview of the transit integration work that we've been doing, um, including that transit integration study. Can you put it in just slideshow mode? Um, let's see, I don't have the slideshow oh, the open. Yeah. So it, yeah. Close enough. Never mind. And uh, just uh, I'll ask the folks that are uh, virtual because your your voice is softer than us loud mouths. <laughs> Can you guys hear her okay as she's speaking? <clears throat> yes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, you know, as this committee requested um, a while back. I'm providing information on the transit integration project that SCTA is coordinating in collaboration with Petaluma Transit, Sonoma County Transit, and San Rosa City Bus. So I'll be pro providing uh, background on the transit integration work, an overview of the project, as well as how it fits in with uh, regional collaboration and transit integration work as well. It's on. Um, try to go back there to the full screen. It's. Do it works now? No. Sorry about that. Um, I think we may. What's that? Um, you know, we we may be stuck with it unless you'd like to share it. We won't label you Johnny Blind. You want to give it a try, Drew? Those are waiting to get started on that. I just got a comment. You guys look like the Golden State Warriors bitch for all the assistant coaches. <laughs> it's like they got 12 players and 13 uh, coaches. <laughs> Growing. All right. Well, thank you. And um, I think we're back in order of presentation. So um, this is just a high level uh, view of the transit network in Sonoma County. Um, Santa Rosa City Bus provides local transit in Santa Rosa. Petaluma Transit provides local service in Santa Rosa, I mean, in Petaluma. And Sonoma County Transit um, provides local transit in all of the cities and in, uh, in between cities and in the unincorporated county. Uh, we also have regional transit provided by Golden Gate Transit and SMART. Uh, next slide. So the, the efforts to integrate transit have a long history. Um, Starting back in 2012, MTC completed the Transit Sustainability Project, which included <laughs> recommendations for <laughs> operators in Sonoma County to pursue functional and institutional consolidation. Um, and in 2019, SETA, in collaboration with the three local bus operators I just mentioned, uh, embarked on the uh, Transit Integration and Efficiency Study, um, also in collaboration with uh, MTC. So the purpose of this study was to identify actions that through collaboration and among the three um, local transit operators would improve the rider experience, increase the efficiency of delivering high quality service and reduce operating and capital costs um, to enable improved service. And in 2020 through 2021, um, MTC uh, kind of in response to Pandemic-related challenges for transit throughout the Bay Area, MTC created the Blue Ribbon Transit Task Force to recognize the critical recovery challenges facing public transit and to advance equity, identify actions, and to implement network management and governance reforms, and to advance transit initiatives and integrate reforms. Uh, next slide. 
So out of the Blue Ribbon Task Force came the Bay Area Transit Transformation Action Plan. Um, this plan identified a problem statement focused on unique policies and procedures, um, as well as practices for each of the 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area, and a lack of customer support for interagency travel. Uh, goals and actions were identified in this plan around fares and payment, customer information, transit network, accessibility, and funding. Um, next slide. So in 2020, um, kind of while that Blue Ribbon Task Force was being um, established, SETA convened a, uh, or established a Future of Transit Ad Hoc Committee. Um, and to really address the pandemic challenges for transit in Sonoma County and um, advance some of the recommendations in the Transit Integration and Efficiency Study that uh, have just wrapped up that previous fall. Um, and to really look at the priorities for um, those recommendations and uh, coordinate with the regional effort. So the ad hoc identified two primary goals, and those were to increase transit ridership and to simplify and enhance the transit customer experience. Um, next slide. <laughs> So the local transit integration project uh, includes four main objectives, and those are integrated service planning for more efficient operations, integrated customer service to improve the customer experience, integrated fares and fare programs to support interoperator travel, communication, and marketing, and integrated information and marketing to expand the reach and improve user experience. Next slide. So this work has three main phases, starting with strategizing on process and form formalizing current integration practices. Um, then moving into planning, including service planning, public engagement, honing in on the functional needs to integrate on the back end um, for the three transit operators. And finally, implementation, um, which includes integrating with the some of the MTC-led programs for mapping and wayfinding, um, fare integration, the regional network manager, and implementing shared branding, technology, bus wraps, and signage. Um, this also includes, uh, yeah, so we're, we're, and as well as integrating more, um, the recommendations for integrated service, as well as schedule, schedule coordination and changes. So we're well into the planning phase, but are still identifying some areas for improved processes, and we're involved in the planning work at the regional level that will lead to the implementation of these programs. Next slide. So we have, uh, there's already been a number of successes with this work. Um, the operators have established a paratransit one seat ride pilot program to reduce the need to transfer between operators and established synchronized schedule change dates. Uh, Sonoma County Transit has uh, established a new customer service number that connects to all three, um, all three transit agencies. And uh, the operators have established a system for cross-training agencies and created a common paratransit application form for all three agencies. There's also been collaboration on joint marketing for Fair Free Days, Fair Free Youth Program for Clipper Start and other joint programs and events. Next slide. So just to dive a little deeper into one of those, um, the One Seat Ride Paratransit pro Program, each operator uh, has a defined paratransit service area based on three quarters of a mile from their existing fixed routes. Um, and so previously, any travel between those service areas required a transfer. This would generally happen, um, you know, in, when the transfer was in Santa Rosa, it would happen at the YMCA. Um, but with the One Seat Ride program, Santa Rosa has agreed to bring paratransit passengers originating within their service area to a number of very popular destinations just outside of city limits. Mm -hmm. um, and 
in exchange, Sonoma County Transit has agreed to bring uh, paratransit riders coming from their service area into Santa Rosa to their final destination, um, even if it's outside of a, a three quarters of a mile from their next route. So uh, this has been really um, appreciated by riders and it's also reduced some of the inefficiencies that were required around scheduling those transfers um, and uh, overall been a, a good, very good success. Uh, next slide. So we have a number of um, things that are underway right now. Uh, the So last spring, we began the integrated transit service planning study that fo is focusing on the overlapping corridors and regional connections um, and service integration, really. And uh, so we did a, a large public outreach effort for this last spring. and. A very heavy data collection lift. Um, that the results from that kind of came out of that data collection really still left a lot of questions, and there was a desire to dig deeper into the data and and the analysis. So we actually expanded our scope for this project and the schedule as well through June. So um, the the plan is still in progress, and you know, once we do have results from that, we'd be happy to bring it back to this committee. Um, but that effort is ongoing. Uh, some other things we're working on is uh, SETA and the transit operators in Sonoma and Marin counties are working on um, they're participating in a transit planning exercise specifically for service along the Highway 101 corridor in Marin and Sonoma counties, um, and so that's just recently begun and um, definitely has a connection with the, the local study that we're doing as well. Uh, through the MTC mapping and wayfinding work, there is a um, prototype for the regional signage and wayfinding uh, that will, that's being planned for the Santa Rosa Transit Mall and the downtown Santa Rosa Smart Station. Um, so that, that regional, um, graphic identity and uh, wayfinding will actually be installed um, at the transit mall and downtown Santa Rosa Smart Station with some wayfinding elements between the two sites. Um, so that's a really exciting um, collaboration with MTC. And uh, we're also working on, on the kind of customer service front, we're working on providing enhanced uh, trip planning service through the transit app for riders in Sonoma County. Um, and we've also been working toward a consistent website design and format um, for the three transit operators, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the next slides. Um, so here is just a, a glimpse at the three websites for the three local bus operators. Um, Santa Rosa City Bus has their uh, transit website on the city's web platform, uh, but Paloma Transit and Sonoma County Transit um, use a, a transit specific platform through a company called Trillium. Uh, so we've hired them to design a website for Santa Rosa City Bus on the same platform and we're working on that design in collaboration with Sonoma County Transit and Petaluma Transit with the idea that their websites will then be updated to have the same consistent look and feel and have elements in the same uh, locations. And eventually, um, once all of those are implemented, we would have developed uh, one single landing page for all three transit agencies. Uh, so user transit riders can more easily find information about um, all three of the service providers. Uh, next slide. So here's an example of um, what uh, you know what that could look like. This is not the design that we're necessarily implementing, but this is an area where a region that has you know a few different bus transit operators and they've developed the same look and feel um, for their individual websites, uh, but really making it easy to navigate between the websites and um, and intuitive for, for customers. Uh, next slide. 
go through the process. So um, on the, yeah, the, the transit integration work that we're doing here ties in with the regional collaboration that's led by MTC on the matching and wayfinding program that I um, have mentioned a few times. Uh, this regional project includes developing a regional transit brand connect and complement the existing transit brands um, and establishing unified standards for transit wayfinding region wide. And because the transit integration work we've been doing in Sonoma County, um, Sonoma County was selected to be one of the sub-regional pilots to test these standards. So in addition to the prototype that will be installed um, kind of in the short term uh, or this year, there's uh, will be kind of a larger pilot that will be rolled out um, throughout Sonoma County. Um, and the work that we're doing locally to kind of functionally integrate uh, we'll really prepare the three local bus operators for implementing the wayfinding pilot. Um, the pilot will create consistent user-focused transit information at touch points throughout Sonoma County. So at bus stops, um, bus shelters, um, wherever you would find a, a transit map. Um, and, a, you know, they will have the, the common graphic identity and design elements for all three bus operators. Um, so we can move on to the next slide um, and happy to answer any questions. Um, we have Rachel Deed from Santa Rosa City Bus and Brian Elvey here from uh, Sonoma County Transit and uh, Jared Hall from Petaluma Transit's also on the line um, in case there's any mm -hmm. questions that are specific to them. So, um, so we've been working on this since 2012, right? So that's like almost 12 years now. What's actually different on the ground for the average transit user? It sounds like for the paratransit that things are very much improved. Um, in my own transit use, just having the clipper card, having one card I can use for anything is, is positive, but when I see all the stuff about branding and website and signage, I wonder um, you know, but when, when someone wants to take transit, it's less about is it this service or that service that I'm here and I need to go there, right? What keeps people from using transit is it doesn't get them from where they are, where they need to go in a reasonable amount of time and the time they need to be there. Um, and so a good look on the website and more signage doesn't really address that. Um, um, so what's being done to actually make it easier to get from point A to point B? And then my other question is, you, you mentioned some data, uh, which I'm assuming was more like customer experience data or public data, but I'm curious about what it was. Was it who, who was being, survey was it existing users was it people who aren't using it because we want to get them to use it because those might be different populations um i'm just curious about what happened with all that because i know i never i don't think i saw a survey but anyway yeah um so there are no more questions i know um <laughs> i take them one at a time um i i think in terms of what has changed you know there's been a number of small incremental changes that um, you know, some may be noticeable to the users and some may not be. They a lot around, um, you know, creating efficiencies from a, a you know, a functional and operation standpoint. Uh, but I, I think that there's a lot of momentum on uh, creating those changes uh, since we've been working on this project and since MTC has been um has developed the transit transformation action plan. Um, you know, in terms of getting from point A to point B more efficiently, you know, a lot of that really has to do with service frequency and um, and that comes down to operations funding. Um, you know, I think that the work we're, the, the transit service study that we're working on, you know, could create some efficiencies operationally um and you know move toward some more frequency um 
but really having a lot more funding for operations is what is going to have you know bring those high frequent um, routes to you and and make it quicker to get around uh, or make make a larger difference in terms of getting around. Um, and in terms of and then you know I have to have the transit operators really on in on your question as well. But um, I think that your last question was about the transit the integrated transit uh, service plan and the outreach that was done. Um, we surveyed both transit riders and non-transit riders. Um, our consultants went and rode the buses and uh, and hung out at at uh, bus transfer stations and transit hubs. Um, passed out surveys on all three of the local local bus operator routes as well as on Smart and Golden Gate. Um, they also tabled at events that were happening throughout the county. Um, I would just say that you know they were a lot more successful in getting transit users, transit riders on the buses to take the survey um, than you know people at other events. It was just um, it's difficult to, to get people interested in the, in the transit survey if they are not uh, regular transit users. Um, uh, but yeah, I believe there were you know over I want to say over five hundred uh, responses to that survey, um, and then was there another piece to that question that I'm missing? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Before I go to you, um, we do have one hand raised up there, so go up there. I can't. Uh, hi. Hi, it's Jerry Glazer. Yeah. Um, and I was supposed to have a representative from NBAA there today, and I see he didn't show. Um, I just wanted to fill in a few things, and I might want to ask a couple of questions, too. I, I think you all know that um, I sit on the Policy Advisory Council uh, for the MTC. Uh, last Friday was a presentation on wayfinding and the discussion that uh, our two sites and El Cerrito would be the prototypes just to test out the wayfinding portions. And there were a number of questions and uh, the same kind of questions were asked. Uh, one question I asked was, uh, you know, how does somebody know what to take and how to get from point A to point B? Part of that's being addressed. Uh, the question of whether the survey, even throughout the Bay Area, it was both riders and non-riders. Um, and that uh, one thing that's not included in this is the wayfinding is going to be everything on the ground, but it's not in the vehicles. And one of the questions I was asking is I'm on smart and I come to a station. It tells me what station it is, but it doesn't tell me what it uh, connects with. Uh, and that's one of the discussions we wanted to have for the future. Anyway, if you'd like to see what it, what the first prototype looks like in the discussion, it was fairly lengthy, uh, over an hour discussing uh, just wayfinding. Um, that's the recorded uh, policy advisory council meeting on Friday. The second thing is I'm a representative in the customer advisory group for regional network management and the effort that we're discussing here is part and parcel of uh, integrating all of the various uh, sites, uh, agencies. Um, and this is the first time that MTC has gotten serious about this because at a state level, they said, why do you have 27 agencies? Uh, do something about that. The one question I did bring up as part of wayfinding, I find it confusing if we're trying to integrate uh, agencies that we have routes that have the same names for different agencies that go to different places. And so one of the things I suggested was that as part of integration, um, we make sure that every route has a unique name. We don't need five route 12s that go to different places um, because you have to know the agency and the route in order to figure out where you're going to. Um, that kind of bothered me. Clipper, I love, and I like to see something done with Clipper, and I know you guys don't do it, um, because as a senior, uh, my Clipper card works as a senior, but I can't use my Clipper off of my phone as a senior at the same time. It's one or the other. And while I was writing on one of our agencies recently, a family came on 
and they had like six people. And this was on smart and they couldn't figure out how to pay the fare because not everybody had a telephone and they didn't all have a card. What happens when guests come uh, and part of our payment system has to handle people who are using the system less frequently. And even though it's now getting consolidated, one of the questions I wanted to ask about our three agencies, it seemed to me that having a centralized operations center might facilitate integration. It might also identify when we have conflicts and routes where things don't match up and we have three separate operation centers. Um, is there any thought on integrating the operation centers? And the last part was part of the regional network management. They gave us a discussion several months ago. And one of the things that we brought up was why isn't a key element of what you're doing become more efficient? And I think in our integration for our three bus agencies, that ought to be a central focus that we improve efficiency because if we improve efficiency, we could extend the services using the same amount of money. Jerry, thank you for your comments. Is there a motion to adjourn now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot, a lot at the MTC as well. <laughs> Dana, I'll let you tackle that. Yeah, so I think that you brought up a lot of good points, Jerry. Thank you. Um, you know, efficiency is definitely you know one of the goals that we're working on with our local in integration, um, and one of the goals of the transit, the integrated transit service plan is really looking at the overlapping service areas and how we can make um, those routes that overlap more efficient. Um, uh, you brought up a point about uh, duplicate number route numbers um, here in Sonoma County. We've identified only three um, route numbers that are duplicate or three sets, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that was something that we actually asked in our survey, um, whether riders on those routes are attached to that particular number. Um, but it's definitely a piece that will you know, we're looking at um, how to renumber the system so that we don't have duplicates, at least within Sonoma County. Um, the larger Bay Area, that's definitely a much bigger uh, thing to tackle, but I think that you know, working on that locally here. Um, in terms of integrating um, operation centers, I may look to one of the transit operators to, to talk more in detail about that, but, you know, the integrated transit service plan that we're working on is um, really trying to create efficiencies between the routes so that, um, you know, the end and kind of create a process for doing planning um, collaboratively moving forward. And, uh, you know, we're coming up with, we're really digging into the data and seeing where um, even data sources differ between the agencies based on how they collect it and the types of programs that they use. Um, and so really, you know, working toward aligning those things and making that integrated planning um, more feasible um, on, on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, David. Tom? I have a number of questions, but they're all short. <laughs> <laughs> Rapid fire. So, lightning round. So, um, <laughs> just to remind us all, paratransit is about what fraction of other transit in terms of numbers? It's less than 10%, as I recall, but I just want to confirm that. Yeah. Less than 10%. Okay. And then you mentioned overlapping corridors, mm -hmm. which are the big ones that pop up? Yeah, so uh, to name a few, um, like within Santa Rosa, um, the corridors with you know, higher frequency of both city bus and Sonoma County Transit Service is along um, Mendocino Avenue and uh, Santa Rosa uh, Avenue. And then as well as kind of going east-west, um, connecting to Sonoma Valley um, into central Santa Rosa. Um, and then in Petaluma, um, 
the um I want to say the Jared, you might need to help me out here. I may be blanking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, two of them, Dana, were North McDowell Boulevard and Petaluma Boulevard were two of the major ones. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh. Um, so it sounds like the website and the payment process is pretty well coming together in terms of integration and the logo stuff. But the transit app, you didn't talk much about the app. And I know Jerry flagged that at MTC for us. Um, and I'm often, as, as a user, that tends to be my primary interface to the system. So I'm curious where that is in, in integration. Yeah, so um, I mentioned the Transit app, and it's actually an app called Transit. So it's not the only Transit app out there, but um, there is an app called Transit, and we are you know, working on getting um, enhanced service for the users, um, as well as what the operators can do and push out, push out messaging through. Um, timeline? Um, we're looking at actually getting, uh, we should be launching that enhanced service in March. Oh, cool. um, that's our current estimate of, of when they could get that going. Um, so. Which ones don't have it today? Because I, I've recognized that it works with the county and it works with Golden Gate. Yeah, so it does, it is available um right now the the basic services but what we're what we'll be doing is doing a pilot for subscribing um to enhanced service so that will allow kind of some more customization on the user end um and it will also allow you to you know, see more routes so different options and you may you may only see if like the first few options um without the enhanced service, but it'll give you more options, um, which, you know, if you're in a in a more dense transit environment, um, that can be um, more useful. But I think, you know, generally the enhanced service is useful. Um, it'll also allow transit operators to push out messaging through the app um, to people that are looking at specific routes. So if there's a, delay or an issue with that route, um, it'll be a good way to, to get the notifications out. Cool. And then uh, uh, tonight, the uh, city of Sonoma is meeting to discuss the general plan update. And I was just reviewing our circulation element and it mentions the Napa transit service line, which was eliminated from the city of Sonoma in the last couple of years. There's no, the integration work you're talking about now does not include Napa or Solano County in any way, right? Uh, not the, not the local integration work. Right. Program. And then finally, um, I've heard rumors of a piece of state legislation that's been in, introduced to sort of force the Bay Area to do broader transit integration. Is there an update on that? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot going on <laughs> in that <laughs> arena. Um, and I'm not sure I'm the, the best person to speak to all the details and the status of it, but um, I think that, you know, there was a piece of legislation that uh, was very heavy handed and it seems like that's been pulled, mm -hmm. um, but there's still, you know, some desire for, to include um, integration. Right, because I'm worried so. about stranded investments and time spent right now. So thank you. Indulgence of those questions. Three, three more quick questions. Thank you. Yes, Carol. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the support that MTC is giving this pilot and when the end date is, um, the funding and maybe administrative support they're providing. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's there's a regional efforts, uh, the Bay Area regional efforts that MTC is leading, and um, like the the greater mapping and wayfinding project, for example, MTC is staffing and leading and inviting the local transit operators and SETA to participate in the, the planning and development of that. Um, you know, in terms of staff support for our local um, programs, they um, they helped fund our initial uh, transit integration study that we uh, wrapped up in 2019. And you know, a lot of the work that we've been doing here has enabled us to, um, you know, be be those 
that first pilot, one of those first pilots for the mapping and wayfinding, and as well as the um, the prototype for the installation in in Santa Rosa. And when is the end date? Um, you know, I, it's a, it's I don't know if it's <laughs> very well defined for, um, but I you know I think that the the look for the mapping and wayfinding program is within the next few years. Huh. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Jake, and then Dennis, and then Catherine. Brevity is our friend. <laughs> <laughs> the piece of legislation, Senate Bill 397 by Senator Wahab from Fremont, uh, lasted about a week. Okay. There was not a great wave of enthusiasm that <laughs> spread across the legislature, evidently for actual efforts to pursue consolidation of the number that should have everybody's attention at the beginning of this report, and that is there are 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area. I would suggest at the moment, I know that you're working diligently around the margins, and that's the way you've talked about it, but until there's some effort to actually have a Bay Area Transportation Authority, I, I think it's doomed, frankly. Not in my lifetime, but my lifetime's short. Not in my children's lifetime. Their lifetime's a lot longer than mine. So um, that, to me, is the natal. Well, it's more than natal that hasn't been grasped. But in any event, for example, in Sonoma County, it's my recollection when I was serving an MTC and SCTA, that there was a, an effort to have consolidation of transit services in Sonoma County. I gather there's no enthusiasm for creating a Sonoma County Transportation Authority. There was, a, there was an interest in the Sonoma Marin Transit Authority. That probably came out of MTC. My memory's not as good as it was, but until we get serious about actual consolidation. And I understand the political difficulties. I understand that the Golden Gate Bridge uh, District is a separate political entity, uh, not governed by the state. All of these things I understand. So I don't really have a question. I would. I uh, wish everybody well in getting the, <laughs> all of the timetables together. I mean, I'm a person who started off commuting into San Francisco in 1972 when the Golden Gate Bus District took over the old Greyhound contract to provide commute services, 1972. And I also once got to a meeting in San Jose on public transit from here. It took me three and a half hours. So I guess the other observation is that the infrastructure of transit in the Bay Area is not conducive to meeting the desires of commuters. And that's my example from here to San Jose, three and a half hours, and then a two hour meeting, and then three and a half hours back. Now, if you do the arithmetic there, okay, that's an eight hour day. To go to a two hour it takes me three and a half hours to make my commute to my meetings in San Francisco now. <laughs> well, I know I I did that for 12 years on MTC. So anyway, I'm sorry to be not my usual cheerful and optimistic self. <laughs> I've, I've felt, yeah, Jake Downer. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jake. I just want to pipe in, Jake, Jake, the reason for the regional network management organization being formed by MTC is to figure out how to do that. Well, <laughs> good luck. Right, we, get, we get Dennis. Okay, real quickly, and Jake kind of touched upon it, is that uh, Dana used the, the word integration, and Jerry's the first one that used the term consolidation. And uh, I'm now understanding that the two are not the same, that integration is just working friendly with each other and trying to, you know, change colors and then get our websites together. And consolidation is that we still have 27 agencies out there with its own separate administration and opportunities out there. Am I got that correct? 
That is correct. Sorry. All right. All right. So just one need a clarification. Thank you. A couple of little pearls of wisdom dropping here. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> Kathleen and then Steve. <laughs> A question about the paratransit integration because I know that was a big thing in the study that came out and there was a lot of um, energy around it and I know it was an MTC's coordinated plan um, a recommendation that paratransit services be consolidated one paratransit agency for Sonoma County because I when the study was done I believe it was um, volunteer wheels for Sonoma County and the transit for the cities um, so that's three different contracts, three different contract administrations, RFPs, drivers, mechanics, you know, vehicles, and, and for 10% of the rides or services, that seems very inefficient. Um, and I, I hear it's the most expensive ride too. So I wondered if there's any energy around that, if that's still a priority. And then my other question goes to what Jerry was saying about technology. Um, what I hear from our disabled clients, people who are older, um, they don't all have cell phones. They don't, if they have a cell phone, a lot of them don't know how to download an app. Yeah. Um, none of the providers, except for Maria Petaluma, does any kind of community education. None of the, they don't go to senior centers and teach seniors how to do this. Um, so seniors aren't riding the bus because they're super intimidated. They don't know how. Um, they don't know how to use the technology. They don't know how to ride the bus. There's no education around it. So we get a lot of calls <laughs> from people who are so frustrated with public transit and paratransit that they just, you know, they, they, they won't even go near it. And if we want more people to ride the bus, we want to fill those buses. We need to educate people and we need to meet people where they are which is not in the technology sector for, for many. So I would say to send those right, send those, those people that you're hearing from um, to the transit agencies. I mean, there's, I think that there's a lot of willingness to provide um, rider, uh, rider training. And I know that, um, I know City Bus has a program um, and, you know, I think that there's, you know, if there are especially locations where there's a lot of seniors or potential paratransit users um, in one place, um, I think there's definitely opportunities to provide that education. So, um, yeah, just encourage you to pass along that information. Great, um, Great comments, Kathleen. Yeah, and in terms of uh, paratransit consolidation, um, you know, I think that, you know, functionally, uh, the one seat ride programs is something that has, you know, gotten closer to some of those those issues with the different service areas. Um, and, you know, there would need to be, if there were an effort to consolidate them, there would need to be an entity to take that on and, and um, operate the service. So. Before we go to Steve, I think we had, did you have a comment to her comments? I'm just going to say that's the generational piece of us. We do have a travel train. We just started a travel training at a senior housing facility today. So, yeah, I'm, I'll give you my card and any any folks you hear of who could use a training, I'd be happy to get someone out. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? <clears throat> I sit in on the uh, transit uh, uh, tack now and then. And as this question came up, uh, the the initial issue is, there are different labor unions representing different features of each of these organizations. So that's a stumbling block. The minute you try to consolidate it, the, the unions are up in arms. Um, so I congratulate uh, the staff for, for working on this as hard as you have. Um, the, uh, the question I have about connection with the with the audience with the travelers is how, how about using MapQuest as a way of people finding out how to get from one place to another rather than trying to reinvent the wheel uh, at the local level um, I noticed that smart 
and uh, uh, Golden Gate Bus are not part of the group that we're trying to work with uh, because they serve other counties and that just adds to the difficulty. Um, and then the other bright spot is that a group of transit folks made a trip to Switzerland to see how they produced the system that they have produced. Well, the answer was, it took them 35 years. We've got six years to reduce our driving by 25%. Uh, so we've got a big task before us. Let's all put our shoulder to the wheel. That's all I can say. <clears throat> My, my only comment would be, and maybe you can comment on this a little bit, is is there a solution to the roadblock slash bottleneck that we just heard where labor is fighting for their individual fiefdoms with 27 different groups? So no matter how hard we work and how much we put our shoulder to the wheel, is that going to be the end-all be-all? So I guess that's a question for for you, I think. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I'm just I'm just picking on you because she already said something. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Brian Albee from Sonoma County Transit. Um, you, you know, I think when you look at the, the labor issue, you're right. There's many, many uh, labor unions um, involved with all the transit systems. Some of them aren't, aren't uh, unionized. But when you look at consolidation, most of the uh, the projections go to the highest rate. San Francisco, Muni, the, the bigger systems have the highest hourly rate, highest benefit rate, and that's that everything is based on going down. So when you look at consolidation, you look at cost savings and where efficiencies are, if, you know, and our biggest expense in transit is, is labor. And so if everything goes to the top notch, now we're all together, but we don't have enough money to operate. So um, it sounds like a simple solution, but as Jake pointed out, it's it's very difficult. Um, just just in this county, you know, we have uh, the county and the city and and and, and Petaluma. We have Smart. We have Golden Gate. All of them have their own uh, political um, bodies that we all report to. And we're in the in the Bay Area. We're a very small part of the collective, and it gets more complicated as you go south. So, thank, thank you. Yeah. Leave, leave it to this committee to figure out the nuts and bolts of the roadblocks. You know, this, this, I, I just got to hand it to you. I'm so impressed with this committee and attendance and the interest and everything. You, it, it, you can't be a shrinking violent and come and present to this committee because you're going to get it right back, right? <laughs> That's true. Can I, if I could just add one thing, you yeah. know, I agree with everything Brian said. And I, I think, um, you know, just so everyone's aware, there are very specific federal transit worker project protections. Um, you hear it called 13C, it's a section of the federal code. And so that is part of what drives um, bringing people up to the, to the, the highest, uh, the highest wage and the highest um, package in the group and which is you know not a bad thing right we all want workers to be paid well we live in a very expensive area but it is true my concern is if we rush to consolidate before we really understand um the implications we could end up with service cuts and, and that's not anything any of us want so i think we just have to be very careful um i, I also want to say like i'm very optimistic about integration i i i mean i always say you have to be a perpetual optimist to make a career in transit and i think that's true but I think the kinds of things we're doing, and yes, we haven't gotten um, gotten to fruition on the street with many of them yet, but it's more momentum than I've ever seen in my career. And I've been around for a bit. And, um, and I think that the types of integration steps we're taking now, they go beyond the surface and the kind of window dressing and really get to how do we integrate service delivery to make the most of our limited operating funds and put a system out on the street that really makes the most sense to riders. And so anyway, I, I just wanted to be on the record saying, um, I think I think we can get a long way towards an improved transit system without, um, even if we're not um, pursuing the full consolidation. So I'm just editorializing. Sorry, I just jumped in. No, I like the optimism. Please give Jake a call off record and talk about the cliff. Just two seconds. <laughs> Real quick, Harris. Harris first, and then Dennis. Follow up to that. I I kind of agree about like I'm not necessarily thinking that uh, consolidation in the entire Bay Area would serve the North Bay. Mm -hmm. In lots of ways, I don't think it would. 
but the consolidation among our three local agencies, like are the differences that big among those three that that would cause the problem? Well, I think I think you know we've got one system that has employee, you know, public employee operators, that city bus, and then two systems that have private contractors, and I think that is a little bit of a challenge right out of the gate. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm not going to sit here and say that consolidation will never be the answer in Sonoma County, but I do think the building blocks that we're doing right now in terms of the integration steps, they don't preclude that if that ever ends up being the outcome that that the community deems serves the the rider um, the best, but. Um, you know, it doesn't sort of presuppose an outcome that might come with a lot of unintended negative consequences. So, yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't know sure a real problem that I think in the North Bay area for integration is a smart in, in the ferry system. Mm -hmm. And so I think you, whenever you sit there and you, well, is it possible to do and work together? It's a very positive situation the last, and it's getting better each time along. So there, there is hope. And, and, and I don't want to be saying there isn't. And so if we could then somehow get the local transit to work with this smart and everything else, it really would be a positive you know, motion going forward. So last comment, that's it. Nope, Jeff's got one more. I just wondered, you, know, you <laughs> said that possible rates could go up or um, so the system could be cut if you consolidated because it'd be moving to the highest rates. But of course, that doesn't take into account many other efficiencies and management and such. And I'm wondering if there's ever been any kind of audit that would recommend any particular, you know, maybe not 27 into one, but if, has there been any kind of audit that said, you know, here's the redundancy here. If we put these two together, we get this and that. Because that's really what you need to be able to make that statement accurately. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of any. I think I think that's what uh, is proposed in, in the current bill. Now, uh, the one that was introduced a couple of weeks ago got dropped, and I think there's now a second one, and it's it's to consider or to do a study of consolidation of the transit systems. I think the first one kind of presupposed what the what the final product would be. This one works back and says, okay, let's let's study it, and I think uh, you know that will go on probably for two or three years, but uh, I think that would get the, the answer that you're looking for. Thank you to everybody. Dana, thanks for your presentation. Staff, I'm going to guess that you guys had a five or 10 minute uh, estimation for that presentation. <laughs> you <laughs> miss it. <laughs> sure, no, no way. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody had a question, Drew or Ross, did you? No, I was still on like, you know, that uh, pair of hawks point of but I think you've been oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to cut anybody off. Yeah, I was just going to say really quick, the latest bill, uh, Jake mentioned the one that was shelved. The latest is 926, Senate Bill 926. And whereas the prior version that met the uh, quick death called for full-on consolidation, this one calls for a study to look at region-wide consolidation. I believe this one is still alive. Uh, we'll see what kind of support it has, but that one is still out there. And to Rachel's point, I think a lot of the work that we're doing, I think, is great. We, of course, did the TIE study, the Transit Integration Efficiency Study, several years ago that laid out several of the pieces from incremental all the way up to full consolidation. And I think we've been working over the past few years to do a lot of the work that Dana was talking about, which is great, because it really is kind of a scaled thing that you do. We're doing the easiest pieces now that provide the most benefit, you know, overall. As you go on further and further, it gets more and more complex, more and more fraught, and more and more difficult by the time you get into wage and labor negotiations and things like that. But that is always pieces out there that it could get to that point. But we're doing the pieces we can now to kind of move that along in the meantime. Jared, was that Senate Bill 926? We didn't, I'm not sure we picked up the number. Yeah, sorry, Senate Bill 926. Introduced by who? Wahab, Senator Wahab, W-A-H-A-B, on January 12th. Hi. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana. Great job. Great job. Mm -hmm. Shauna, you got 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Shauna has great skills, so we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> So I, I mean, the, the problem is everybody's got great questions and great comments. It's like you you got a lot of roll. Right? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Drew. 
Uh, so I will try to make this brief. Uh, we brought you the measure M, the draft measure M annual report last month. And so this month we've brought you the polished version. It's been to the graphic artist. We tried to make, um, we tried to take as many of the comments as were uh, appropriate and make changes. Uh, you know, if there were typographical changes or if they were for clarity's sake, we definitely made those. There were some other comments that we did get that did not get incorporated, just, you know, to be upfront about it. So I'm just going to run through this really quick and then we can go over any questions you might have. Uh, I think I can skip a lot of it uh, because, I mean, I can skip over quite a bit of it. Are you going to highlight as you go, excuse me for <laughs> interrupting, are you going to highlight which m modifications you're addressing I was now? I you planning on doing that. That's fine. So questions afterwards, I'll have to root those out. Yes, if please. Needed. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so today we're asking for a recommendation for approval to the board. This so <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Now we're cooking second. <laughs> See none approved. Uh, after we after we uh, do today's presentation, we take the document before the board. Then the document will get printed and make hard copies available to anybody who wants them. Otherwise, it will be posted to the website. Next slide, please, Drew. Are we ready to share those? our copies publicly now or should we wait uh until copies? the board approves it i like to i like to hold off in case i have to make any last minute changes thank you i won't interrupt again okay <laughs> uh just quick reminder measure m was enacted in 2020 in 2005 goes to 2025 it's quarter cent sales tax uh it's expected to exceed 31.7 million dollars annual annually for fiscal year 23-24 next slide please Drew. This just shows you what our forecast was versus what our actual revenue has looked like. So you can see that we are um, currently above what the projections were, but overall we are still slightly below what we were what we were hoping for. So we're looking at about ninety seven percent of the original um, projections. Not bad. Um, this gives next slide, please. Drew. Thank you. Uh, so the market is downwards, but overall we currently forecast, as I said, about 97% of the 20, 2004 estimates. Next slide, please, Drew. And this uh, just gives you a visual representation of what uh, the measure M consists of. So there are six primary categories. There's the apportionment categories, which include the local streets rehab and the local bus transit. And then the project specific programs, category, which includes the 101 and local street projects, bicycle and pedestrian projects, and rail, and uh, closing it out with 1% that is used for administration. Next slide, please, Drew. So the apportionment programs disperse funds directly to the jurisdictions based on a 50% population, 50% road mile formula to the local streets rehab, and the um, on the current Transit Development Act, formula for local bus transit. And here you can see some quick photos from some of the jurisdictions on how they spent their LSR funding. So you can see a before and after picture of East Katati Avenue. We've got some equipment that's uh, about to start mowing this roadside. Uh, and then upper right-hand corner there is grinding and overlay in the city of Cloverdale, and then street paving in the city of Petaluma. Next slide, please, Drew. So local bus transit funding goes towards operations and is a key source for ongoing service because of the stable and predictable nature of Measure M. And the bicycle and pedestrian program uh, includes funding for specific projects and ongoing programs and uh, included here are images of the bicycle safety and education program. And of course, some of our buses. Next slide, please, Drew. I believe you guys uh, might be familiar with this slide. We used it last year, but it gives you a, uh, an idea of where we started and where we ended up. Mm -hmm. Highway 101 is another project-specific program in Measure M. Highway 101 program is winding down now that all three lanes are open and operational from the county line. Changed today. South, yeah. Look at that handsome gentleman. South of Petaluma <laughs> to Windsor. <laughs> Remaining funds in the program will be used for follow-up landscaping projects along the corridor. 
The photos you see here in the upper left are the groundbreaking ceremony for the first HOV lanes through Santa Rosa in 2001. <laughs> And uh, the final ribbon cutting ceremony for the HOV lanes in Petaluma in 2022. The ability to complete the continuous HOV lanes from the county line to Windsor wouldn't have been possible without Measure Act. Next slide, please, Drew. The Local Three Projects Program funded advancement of multiple projects this year shown here are a visual simulation of the roundabout at the intersection of highways 116 and 121. Uh, we're also showing the construction of phase one, segment one of the Fulton Road improvements from Piner to Guerneville, and also construction of the Mark West Springs Road improvements, including installation of sidewalks, curb, and gutter. Not shown on here, but also advanced was the Hearn Avenue interchange project, which is set to go to construction in spring of this year. Next slide, please, Drew. Rail program had an appropriation for $2 million for fiscal year 22-23 and expended over half of it on the development of the Petaluma North Station. And so we get to the end. So what's next? Measure M will end revenue collection on March 31st of 2025 and Go Sonoma will begin on April 1st, the very next day. And SCTA RCPA staff just finished developing a draft of the Go Sonoma strategic implementation plan for the board's approval this past December. And staff is anticipating finalizing that document by April and taking before the board that month. And next, next slide, please, Drew. That's it. So, the graphic card is really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there is a copy of, of the document in your agenda packet, as well as a link if you'd prefer to look at it online. Mark. Small housekeeping item. Um, I would like to not give my identical twin, Michael, credit for working on this committee oh. because he doesn't exist. <laughs> So my name, is, my name is listed as Mike. Oh, oh I'm so, so sorry. That I will make sure that that gets fixed. <laughs> 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 my, my identical twin still here. Not even lie. Yeah. yeah, I think your your uh, yours is yours is correct on there. I apologize. Yeah, yeah no, I want to make sure that no, that gets fixed. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yeah, Tom. Um, I was just noticing in the minutes we just approved. There were two questions that we brought up last time. Mm -hmm. uh, one was about adding transit ridership to the discussion, mm -hmm. and the other one was pavement conditions. Yes, so we did discuss it, and I did go back and listen to that whole discussion because it kind of went on for a while, and oh, yeah. it went all over the place. So <laughs> um, we staff looked at it in-house and uh, decided that with the for the pavement condition, with the reports that come out of MTC that are so substantive, it didn't really belong in this annual report, which is really about how we expended Measure M dollars, not about the payment condition itself, but about how the money was spent. Mm -hmm. So we chose not to address that question. And um, for the transit ridership, I provide what the transit operators provide to me. So that is included. Were you looking for something other than what is included in there because Jerry had just mentioned and I thought there was a good discussion around the table about cost per ride for each district oh, okay. and and then also I guess our transit I've seen those data before but I don't think they make it into this annual report and I think that was the recommendation is that we think it those are some of the metrics we should be managing the cost per ride the cost per ride so Okay. And the reason I had brought that up was it was a combination of both how well we're using the system and, and how well we're running the system. My, my comment with that was that uh, this is a re response to Measure M and the spending of Measure M, not about the transit and, and uh, the cost efficiencies. And I think that's where the discussion ended, was that we're reporting on exactly the Measure M and uh, the annual report was relative to that. And that was my memory. And I think that's how the meeting minutes would reflect. Yeah. As um, Highway 101 staff, 101 line staff mm -hmm. do this next year, is staff going to present a prepared final financial report on that entire 
efforts because because I have a couple questions. <laughs> you know what the goal is now, for instance, 40 percent we should come in underneath that and make it money and bond. So there's financial engineering going on there. So 40 percent, and then and I know I've asked before, how much money we were able to leverage in because of measure M. And frankly, public people, the people I meet, who know I'm on this committee, that's the kind of question I get asked socially. Okay, how much does it cost per mile? And I know in our financials, there are like 11 categories that say 101 on them, bond and construction. And that, I know that's not the entire cost. There's a bigger lever there. And so will there be a final report with some issues? We could certainly consider it. Um, I would say that 40% of the measure is 40% of the measure. So we wouldn't have exceeded that or and okay. so that that's what we're limited to. So we work every all the all the uh, programs are siloed so that we wouldn't exceed so over one for you. Is. Yes, unless there was a loan which would be do well documented and then paid back. There wouldn't be so that boundaries firm. Yes, that's correct. Okay, but then the final the final the leveraging and the leverage. I I, 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 interesting. And yeah. I think the the board, their elected officials, would kind of certainly want to know. And we have reported in the past that it's about five to one that we have been able to to leverage about five dollars to every one dollars okay. of measure M. Um, but it. Uh, we, we would have to go back and ground truth that now that we're really winding down because that figure came a little, you know, it was it was probably five or six years ago that we that we started using that. So um, I think it's fair to go back and look at it. So, we'll, you know, I can take it back to staff and, and see if we should be developing a, a final report. I mean, I imagine that Measure M will have a final report of some kind once we get done. But <laughs> done is a is a relative term for Measure M because while we will stop collecting revenue we are not going to stop having money we still have money to spend that and and it's designated for certain things so i only want to warn this down to its final it's getting there for sure one or two yeah we have we have some landscaping that has to be done along the corridor now that the now that the construction is done but that's tr that's true but that means we'll have an annual report for measure m every year that the money still remains in the in the kitty. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Although it will probably it will it will all. it will probably start to look different once we start going into Go Sonoma and winding down with Measure M. Yeah, and Tom, real quick, I a, a measure of cost per mile, if, if that's what you're looking at, that would be so subjective because some of these dollars went into the bridges and so forth. There's a lot of other things specific. other than just the surface. I realize not all miles is the same, <laughs> but it's a 30 mile project overall. That's the kind of question I get answered. Okay. Yeah. The county, if you're a ranger, the, the county line, how much? Yeah. Fair enough. And I was talking about transit ridership. Thank you. Good yeah. question. And I'll ask the accountant of the group, uh, <clears throat> James, yes, sir. in the back. Uh, uh, isn't the in the main, in the year to date, or I'm sorry, in the total programs to date, as of December 31, 2023, measure M cash flow statement that's presented in the accounting statements in the board. That represents what under that category of, of 101, Highway 101. Doesn't that include, that includes all of the measure M plus the other funds that's accepted for the program, right? Yeah. And is that not the total cost of that? Uh, it represented in there so no it's it's you actually have to get into the details of the strategic plan to get the information that he's looking for what the number you're referring to dennis includes some pass-through funding yep. so if we had money that was coming to us from state federal regional sources we would then deposit that within the measure m highway 101 account and then pay for things over and above so you'll you um Looking at the financials where you want to look at how we're constrained to the 40%, you can look at sales tax revenue received, but on the expenditures, those pass-throughs inflate them artificially. But I mean, the, the numbers you're looking for are, are five to one and about $15 million a mile. Oh, so okay. that's, I mean, and, and that, and that, it, <laughs> and, we, and we, and we sell, we, we sell, we celebrate that on a regular basis. <laughs> that, that's, and, 
Yeah, and you know, I, I do, I do want to say that that 15 million is is very subjective because of the types of improvements along the corridor, right? So when you look at that first section from Santa Rosa to Roner Park, that you know was just really that was like the simplest section. Then you look at like the downtown section through Santa Rosa, one of the the most complicated sections, uh, or the Petaluma River Bridge. But um, on average, that's that's what it costs per lane. Is it, it, I gotta ask the question, and well, is that for right. four lanes? What width is that 15 million per mile? So that, that's, that is, that is. Um, or is that per traveled lane, per million? Travel, traveled lane. So that's yes. per mile per lane. Yes, per thank lane. you. Yes. That's a better per way of putting it. Yeah. Per lane mile. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Study earlier. Yeah. So each mile is 14 times four. No, no. One what, lane in each direction. So what one what so one lane in each direction would be about thirty million dollars on average. Yeah. Damn contractors. I seem to remember a slogan: three lanes all the way." Right. Yeah. <laughs> Back of the mist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Thank you. So yeah, Jerry. Um, one question. I, I have to apologize. I didn't get a, a chance to read through this version. Um, did, was there something included? I heard the word leverage. And as a taxpayer, one of the things I was impressed by when I read the reports was, hey, we're collecting this amount of money, but because we collected this amount of money, we were able to leverage this amount for our, our transportation. Um, is that included in the report? And if it's not, I think it should be something which is standard. Uh, so that people who read the reports look at it and say, "Aha! I, I, you know, I paid uh, 15 cents and I got 75 cents worth of uh, benefit." I couldn't agree with you more, Jerry. <laughs> uh, we do. So the answer to the first part of your question is five to one uh, leveraged amount, and that mostly applies to the 101 program. If we were to look at the entire program of measure, all of the programs under Measure M, it's a much harder figure to come to because reporting across the programs has not been consistent. Some of the jurisdictions, especially early on, reported exactly what they were supposed to have as a match, not necessarily what they actually paid, but what was required. So they were required to have a 50% match. So they would just say, we spent X dollars. We, <laughs> we also <laughs> matched it with X dollars, even though what they actually spent was probably more than that. So, uh, and then in the, in the bike ped program, there was no match required at all. However, many of the jurisdictions did in fact need to add additional funding to each one of those projects in order to deliver them. So it's very difficult, but none of that was reported because they weren't required to have a match. So they didn't fill out the forms that way. So there's just no way at this point, not, there's not no way we could certainly estimate it, but it is a much uh, hairier concept to try to get the match record or the, the leveraging information for the whole of the measure. So what we can tell it, true success. Yeah, I was just, even at, at an estimate level, it tells part of the story. And, and, and the place that I got it was when I realized that we used part of the Measure M funds to show that uh, this is part of the collected monies for fares. So therefore, we could leverage more of the money that came in because we had fares of such and such a percent. All right. Thank you, Shauna. And we are now looking for the motion and second that we jokingly started out this discussion with. <laughs> make a motion to accept the report as presented. Thank you. Second by Eric. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify aye. 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 Oppose? Abstentions? Seeing none, motion carried. John, I'm going to make sure you, your name yeah. gets changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Yeah. Mike so <laughs> brother from another mother. Is the brother when my name gets messed up? I think Jimmy. Oh, I can believe it. Actually, I usually have to do this. We are on to Measure M financial statements. Brenton and David. Hello, everybody. 
Hello. Riding off a little cold, I'll talk loud. So okay. You can all hear me? Okay. Uh, let's see, Drew, can I share here, please? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. 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 Okay, so this month we are reporting on the last two months of financials since we there wasn't a meeting last month. And I'm going to start off just by going over what's included in the packet. It's the same thing as most months. Our first sheets here are the combined balance sheets of the Measure M program, which is a picture of where the entire program is as it stands as of December 31st. Next, there, uh, the balance sheets are split out per program. Following that, there's a year-to-date cash flow report. And then after that is the program to date cash flow report showing all of the dollars that have come in and gone out since the start of Measure M. Let's see. So the revenues since the last meeting, which are the months of November and December, were $5,212,805. And our year-to-date revenues are now $11,036,922. The expenses for November and December were $2,753,770. Uh, with the year-to-date expenses of $3,337,502. And Measure M is now sitting on a cash balance of $66,358,804. Yep, so the revenues for the two months were $5,200,000, and those were all sales tax revenues for the months of September and October. And the expenses of $2.75 were primarily LSR and LBT contributions to other governments as well as $162,000 in consulting services on various projects and $62,700 in staff time. And then finally, this month, we are also presenting the bond disclosure. This is filed by the county treasurer on our behalf. And it's mostly just a report on the 2015 sales tax bonds. Uh, just a couple of notes in there. Sales tax revenues for last year were up 1.22% versus uh, fiscal year 21-22. We're expecting taxes to decrease by 1.5% in the coming year. And the sales tax revenues for the entire program are currently sitting at 97.3% of the 2004 estimates. Perfect. And that's all from me, unless there's any questions. <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We need is that information only or do we need a motion of this then? Well, yeah. on we go. Safe routes to school presentation. Christina. Hi everybody. Um I just want to do a time check. I understand the meeting ends at 5 30. I have a 10 minute presentation, but I don't know if you need me to shorten it or um what you would like me to do. I can try to breeze through some of the slides. Shorten if possible. I'll do my best. Thank you. And uh, while she's bringing that up, I just want to um, give a you know brief uh, overview that, and I'm sure you all are aware that SCTA manages the funding for the Safe Routes to School program and the contract with the Bicycle Coalition for this. Um, this year, the Safe Routes to School program has not actually used any Measure M funds because it. Uh, was used up in previous years, um, but we want to continue to provide presentations annually to this committee. And, um, you know, it's possible that some uh, funding from Go Sonoma will go toward this program in the future. So um, thank that's you why for we that clarification, it. Dana. <clears throat> yes. Thanks, Dana. I, I skipped to that slide um, just because it makes sense to just show you that we are funded through OBAG and uh, we OBAG, uh, the um, our contract with SCTA was extended till 2027. Um, so we're in year six of a nine year contract now, and we've extended about 53% of the funding. I do expect that we will have a shortfall and we'll be uh, needing that Go Sonoma funding to maintain or uh, continue to um, meet the demand for the program. So uh, program components, uh, I'm gonna talk about the program components. So I'm just gonna leave this slide for y'all, but basically our program uh, consists of evaluation and encouragement, education and support for uh, engineering and enforcement. 
Uh, so I'm going to skip just for in the interest of time this slide. Um, and this slide is just one you may have seen before if you're on this committee. It is a timeline um, just to really demonstrate that our program is a year round program. Um, there's a lot of overlapping initiatives. Um, we are busy year round, either prepping, coordinating, or implementing various aspects of the program on all of these areas, the encouragement area, the education area, and the evaluation enforcement engineering area. So you can look at that more closely on your own time, but just wanted to just be clear, it is not just a school year program, it's happening all year round. Um, I, I always like to talk about evaluation first. Um, every school that we serve comprehensively uh, is... Uh, we do a certain amount of evaluation with, which uh, includes doing GIS map showing where students live in relation to their school. Um, this is a map of Helen Lehman Elementary School showing that 93% of their kids live within two miles of the school, 86% live within a mile, 25% live within a half a mile, 10% live within a quarter mile. And with all of our, all of our comprehensive schools, we also do tallies to determine how many kids are actually walking and biking. Um, and at Helen Lehman, just to compare, we had about 11% walking and biking. Um, and it's really clear kind of why that's happening at Lehman. When you look at the GIS map, you can see how many families live on the other side of the Jennings Railroad crossing that is blocked. And in order to get to school, they'd have to walk a mile and a half versus walking just a mile, I mean, half a mile to school. So that's a definitely a barrier at that school. And there's, you know, other, other, um, we are often enlightened by the, those maps um, for various reasons. Um, and they help us identify meetup spots and they help us identify potential routes to school um, and just potential for mode shift. So uh, another thing that is new this year that I wanted to kind of bring to your attention is that we have a page on our website. It's under, it's on the Sonoma Safe Routes website. Um, and it's under events and plans. There's a page called travel plans and we've made public all the data that we have collected for schools that are engaged with the Safe Roots program. So if you go to that page and you click on a school, you can see how the school engages with the program. You can see their GIS data, their tally data. You can see their GIS map. You can see what the documented concerns are at that site all kinds of info. I'm not gonna go into it now on you know an individual page, but just to know that that's public information now or to make facilitate better communications with local jurisdictions about um, you know what the needs are of individual schools and what uh, schools are engaging with the program. Uh, Program-wise, uh, encouragement, we, uh, we still do monthly themed walk and roll the school days to encourage kids to walk and bike to school. These are our themes this year. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read through them, but I will say that we have 55 schools participating comprehensively this year. We had 45 last year. We have another 10 or so that maybe do like one event a year, but we have many, many schools that are doing at least five um, of these uh, themed months. And uh doing their walk roll days and uh, encouraging walking and biking. And we provide them with resources to do that, promotional materials like flyers and Instagram image, you know, ads and posters and all kinds of uh, materials to help them to sort of turnkey, uh, help them to promote a walk and roll event. Um, and also we provide every month, we have a challenge for the schools to help uh, students to think about and raise awareness of the benefits of walking and bicycling to school and also get them to walk and bike more, not just on the walk roll day necessarily. So some of our favorites from this year, we had a map your route to school challenge in September. In October, we had a challenge that encouraged kids to walk, bike, scooter, or skate every day or as many days as they could. We had a Ruby Bridges walk and roll to school month highlighting equity and diversity and learning about being safe and being seen. In March, we're having a challenge on uh, called March of the Penguins where kids are encouraged to walk 8,900 miles to Antarctica, <laughs> uh, but they can also get miles from uh, observing California birds or penguins or um, learning about penguins and birds through uh, documentaries and, and movies. But we're really just encouraging them to walk, but also kind of learn and appreciate nature. Uh, right now we have our art contest, which we do every, we this is our third year of our uh, I Heart Walk and Roll art contest where we ask kids to draw a picture demonstrating why they love walking and rolling. Um, so that's happening this month. These are some of the winners from last year that went into our promotional calendar that the winners and their teachers and their principals got. It's a really cool and fun um, challenge. It's probably our most popular of the year. 
And then we have Bike to School Day coming up this May. Uh, it's Wednesday, May 8th. Last year, we had 53 schools participate in our second annual uh, not countywide Bike to School Day event. Uh, and the year before was about half that. So we're hoping we even get more schools to participate. And um, we're opening up registration for that pretty soon. We're also offering a webinar uh, to parents and resident, you know, community members who are interested in leading bike trains. I don't have a slide on that, but um, it's on March 13th, and uh, we're sending that that flyer out to all of our school partners, and we'll be posting it in social media and encouraging people to learn about how to lead kids in biking to school safely. Um, we also are again con continuing with our. Uh, in, in education programs, we visit classrooms at second, third, fourth, fifth, and middle school levels, teaching bike or pedestrian safety. We teach ped safety at second grade, bake basics at fourth grade, um, active transportation, communication, and mapping at fifth grade. In middle school, we do drive your bike um, lessons. And this, we're still in the midst of scheduling. Uh, this, These numbers are actually from last year, 42 plus sites. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be 50 plus sites that get education this year, but I don't have numbers um, or totals for this year on that yet, because we do that at the end of the year. And we also increase the number of bike rodeos. We do fourth grade bike rodeos on bike safety skill lessons. Last year, we did 33 sites. This year, 35 um, kids get uh, helmets for $5, they get their bikes checked, and they get trained um, on the basics on their school campus during the school day. And then the with middle school, this year, again, we increased our number of schools. Last year, we served 11. The year before that, it was six. This year, it's 12 sites that get some form of middle school education, sometimes on bike skills. We do bike clubs in some schools. Some schools are using our online curriculum and PE classes, um, but we're really trying to um, deepen our um, uh, and expand our, our middle school reach. In addition to the in-school lessons, we are continuing with our Learn to Ride a Bike series that we partner with uh, Petaluma, Santa Rosa, and Windsor Park and Recreation to do, do once a month classes uh, to help kids and parents um, learn to ride a bike and uh, get out there. And once they've learned, they can join us in one of our family bike workshops or rides that we do. Um, we have our family bike workshops, get families, parents, and kids together riding on the road. Um, and we teach them how to do it safely, but we also get out on the road with them. And we have a workshop in Santa Rosa. We had one in, in September. We did a, we do a couple of family rides with the Wright District uh, this year, which get a lot of, a lot of parents, that school district is super into it. And they get a lot of families on bike in their district rides. And then we're doing a family bike workshop in Sebastopol and Petaluma. The Petaluma one, we're going to be giving away free helmets thanks to the CHP. That'll be in June. And then we have our kids bike adventure camp, third year of that in Santa Rosa from the 10th to the 14th of June. That's with in partnership with Santa Rosa Parks and Recreation. We really deeply get a group of kids, about 15 kids to bike on the road and learn how to fix their bikes and do all kinds of stuff. They just really come out of the camp being sort of bike ambassadors, being bike, biking experts. Um, and we are also continuing our partnership with bike shops in the Bay Area Bike Mobile. Um, we have bike shops at every one of our fourth grade bike rodeos fixing uh, fourth graders bicycles. We don't have the totals for that for this year yet. Um, last year was hundreds of bikes and again, 35 bike rodeos where kids bring their bikes. Um, we also partnered with the Bay Area Bike Mobile last year. They visited 25 schools and fixed 30, 304 bikes. Um, this year, there's a funding gap. So they aren't haven't served our sites, um, but they had a little bit of money. So they are visiting three sites this January and we're we're looking forward to when they get their their funding refreshed and can continue to partner with us to visit schools, um, usually in the after school hours um, to um, to fix bikes really, really comprehensively. Uh, and then we're doing community outreach, tons of community outreach. We are we do school events. We visit PTA and PFOs to do presentations. We go to school staff meetings. We started this year two community task forces, both in Petaluma and in Santa Rosa to bring together uh, folks from schools, from city planning, engineering, um, local nonprofits, Safe Roots programming, to talk about what the barriers are to walking and bicycling, to report out what's being done in those areas, and to really kind of break down those silos between schools and and um, you know the cities to you know help move that needle. Last year, we reached about oh, close to two thousand people through our community outreach. Um, I don't have numbers for this year yet because we do that again at the end of the year, but I'm sure it'll be equal or greater than that. 
Um, and these, again, are last year's numbers. Um, we reached in our in our classroom education, we reached uh, 7,786 students um, in classrooms or, or in our Learn to Rides or Family Bike Workshops or Camp. We included that, that number in there too. Um, again, I don't have totals for this year, but I expect it to be higher than last year. We have greater demand for this program than ever before. Um, and it is, we're doing the best to meet the needs of all the schools that are requesting services. They have to enroll, there's an enrollment in April. And then we assess the schools and we determine, you know, the level of service we can provide for the following year and then meet with all the schools in May, June. And then we start service again in August. Um, one last thing I just want to share is that we did do a parent survey last year, last spring. Um, we had 1,486 English responses and 215 Spanish responses. We asked parents what their barriers were to walking and biking to school, as well as got, you know, pulled data, like, you know, on on um, different questions, but the, all of the responses that we got, all the comments that we got, we divided by school and shared with cities and school districts and the county for their ATP planning processes. And that's also in the school travel plans that are up on that website. So you can see any parent comment that was made. We're trying to keep that you know, in the forefront so that we are aware of what the issues are at schools and can communicate that at any given time. Um, this is our website, sonomasaferoutes.org. Feel free to go up there and explore. You can check out our challenges. You can look at the travel plans. You can see the um, the task force meeting agendas and notes for Petaluma and um, Winds and Santa Rosa, uh, which are all up there. There our next meeting is actually this Wednesday in Santa Rosa uh, at SCTA at four o'clock. If you'd like to join and uh, see what we're doing with our task force, I'll stop now and uh, leave it to anyone. If you have any questions, I know we're kind of probably at time at this point, but um, I can stick around and answer any questions. Thank you, Christina. Seeing no hands raised. We have one, Jake. Electrical bikes and other modes of transportation. Are you coming across that in Santa Rosa and Petaluma? I know in Roner Park that there was a major effort by Department of Public Safety um, to uh, remind parents and children of the requirements of vehicle code and the need for licensing. Yeah, uh, we honestly have not seen, um, We're most of our schools are K-8 at this time, just so you know. Um, in fact, all of the schools that we work with comprehensively are K-8. We haven't seen electric bikes, kids riding electrical bicycles to school. Um, so it hasn't come up in our program that that said, I know it's, you know, the SCBC has provided some training on electric bikes and we did create a educational piece this year that we distributed to all our schools um, on things to be aware of with, uh, you know, having kids ride electric bikes, which is also accessible on our website if you go up there under educational handouts. So um, definitely as we hear concerns and as we hear, you know, that can be integrated into our, our education programming. But um, at this point, we haven't it's not become such a thing as like in Marin, I've heard it's really much more like kids, many more kids are riding electric bikes. We're just not seeing it here. Yeah, most of them. In fact, I am impressed with the work you are doing, you know, like uh, thank you for the great work. I have a question regarding the survey. I noticed uh, the Latino survey uh, response is to around 200. Yeah, it was lower. I don't know why that is. I mean, we, I think one of the reasons, unfortunately, was because SurveyMonkey only allows, unless you pay like so much more money, you have to have two separate surveys. We couldn't, like in order for, we couldn't afford to do the one where like you could just toggle to the Spanish version. So schools had to share two different links for the survey, and that may have made it difficult for them because they, you know, they our school partners shared the survey, and we they shared it many times, and so that's that's uh, that's the only reason. I mean, obviously there are fewer Spanish speaking parents, but not that many fewer. <laughs> I feel like it could have been higher. In fact, my question for you: mm -hmm. What engagement or outreach programs you are doing to? with the Latino community, you know, like uh, we work with uh we when first of all we always ask we always reach out to all schools in Sonoma County about enrolling and we um 
in Sonoma County, the Roseland District, the Bellevue District, um, are and some schools in Sonoma Valley are and also the right district, you know, any school that has a higher percentage of uh, uh, English language learners, we we definitely do extra effort to, you know, reach out to and encourage them to enroll, but we do need them to enroll uh, and have somebody to hold the program at the school. Um, but when we're in a school, all of our materials are uh, available in English and Spanish, all of the promotional materials, all the educational materials. Um, and we, when we are working with the school, we offer to go to their ELAC meeting to engage with parents as well as their PTA. I should have put that on the slide, not just PTAs, but ELACs, um, which are like the English language uh, parent committee sort of at a school and um, trying to get out there at their community events to reach parents directly as well. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Not a lot, you know, but I think uh, mm -hmm. your organization needs to do more in that, you know, context, you know. Absolutely. I agree. I would love to have, um, you know, even more reach into the Latino community. I would love to have a, you know, a, a native uh, speaking uh, Spanish staff person who is out there in the community teaching. I don't have that right now. Um, we have tried to hire someone, um, have not successfully found the right candidate, but it's definitely a huge goal of the Bike Coalition in general to be out in the community more uh, more deeply. We do have um, one of our education staff speak Spanish. Yes, that's true. And She's not a native speaker, but she does speak Spanish. And we do send her to events when we feel like there is a need for a Spanish speaker. Um, I've been, I've been, rec we've been recruiting for a truly bilingual staff person for a couple of years now. I did finally at one point hire someone who was a native speaker and who also was involved in bike education. And, and that individual uh, left after a couple of weeks. It's um, hard as a nonprofit. Uh, to compete with the salaries that are paid by the county and other businesses that are all um, trying to increase their diversity and equity and hire bilingual staff. Um, so we're, we're competing with low pay for a small pool of employees. Um, unfortunately, but that is something that we are making an effort to do. And, and one thing I will say is that um, we really intentionally make our on bike programs happen during the school day for the most part, you know, with the fourth graders so that there is equity so that when we're in a school and we have students that don't have bikes or don't have helmets or wouldn't necessarily come to an after school event because their parents work or they're in aftercare, or they need, you know, so we're, we're really trying to reach all the students in a school when we're doing our education. I, I want to pipe in with that one story, um, uh, Christina, with Sarah teaching the moms. So, yeah, uh, so she was meeting with the English learn the parents, right, of the English language learners, and several of them said that they didn't know how to ride bikes. The mom said, and they wished they could, that they knew, so that they could ride their kids to school. And so, my staff arranged um, a class. Mm -hmm teach all the moms how to ride bikes and she had a, you know a, another person there who was a fluent spanish speaker so they could you know do it in both languages and so this group of moms now can ride you know their kids can ride to school because their moms can ride with them yeah yep. yeah and that's right district that's the that school is in the right school district and that district is the school that has uh that partners with us on their family rides that they initiated. That school district's like, we want to do family rides and we want our families and our parents and kids to be able to do that. And then we support that process by, you know, planning the route and leading the ride and doing a learn to ride lesson in advance so parent, more parents can attend. Um, but we do need those partnerships with the school districts and the schools um, because we can't do it all. Like we need them to take sort of like initiative or the lead to um, say we're we want to do a family ride um, and we're going to support the promotion of that and we're going to show up ourselves to that to some extent I mean we do things without necessarily it being the school that's taking the lead all those family bike workshops are not necessarily the school taking the lead but um, it really does help 
And that's one of the reasons we have the task force too, is to try to engage, um, to break down those silos and really help um, all those schools and parents to understand that um, we're all in this together. Well, thank you. Before we, we're way over time, so I wanted to just wrap things up with the, the um, uh, draft of the uh, board of directors agenda and then our committee meeting dates. The meeting dates are provided in the agenda packet. Um, if you don't have it, I'm happy to print it up for you. It's on the uh, meeting dates board approved for 2024. Are they all the fourth Monday or are they the last Monday? Last Monday, except for May and December. Okay. It might be helpful to point out that's the last page of the packet. You can get to it right away. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and also, um, we open up the packets. Excuse me. Um, our agenda packets, I do link every item. So on the agenda page, like item two, measure M, if you click, if you click above it, it'll take you directly to that staff report itself in the PDF. <laughs> so, lots, lots going on, eh? All right, so uh, for, yeah. 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 All right, so uh, the board will be meeting next Monday. Um, it is separate from the second Monday due to the Lincoln holiday. So we will be moving up the week before on, for the fifth. Mm -hmm. And items going before the board include the December meeting notes, the uh, second quarter financial report, transit integration um, contracts, our CPA items, we have a funding for Sonoma Grand Agriculture County Climate Coalition Agreement, um, the 23 annual report for Measure M, and then some bonding reports. Regular calendar includes the election of officers for chair and vice chair, as well as chair appointments. The 23 SCTA RCPA annual report, um, the briefing book, the 24 overall work plan for SCTA and RCPA, and then advocacy um, services, excuse me, for the 2024 legislative principles and contract approval of state and federal legislative services. Ooh. Try that again next time. Um, and then lastly, the community-based transportation plan update and recruitment. And then our reports and announcements as per usual. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the committee. Thanks to staff. We're adjourned. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for all your time. So, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't need.